Okay. Well, uh, what's going to happen now is, um, once again, with a bit of spontaneity and a bit of a change of up in certain ways of being able to make the day flow. So forgive me as I start to rejig it a little bit. And Quinjan is a time when everything was one. When everything in the spirit country was not separated, everything was united. And if you were to do this in front of your eyes, could you do that for me? Yeah? And look at me or look at something in front of you. If you do that and you're focusing past yourself, your fingers become a bit of a blur. And everything sort of just amalgamates together and you sort of try and figure out what one is using your peripheral vision. But the actual thing is, is that everything is just flowing. And it's very hard to identify what is one thing. And that's what we call Quinjan. And we say a long time ago, we say Kora. But if we're going to go back to when everything was just completely and utterly one flowing, that's Quinjan. And this is now really what I'm going to do is actually step away from that I'm going to go to another place, and that's you. Because we started talking earlier about um, what we're going to do today within the room, and and, um, I'm going to remember her name. She's going to talk about spirituality in a few moments. And I thought maybe when it comes to connecting to an old movement of spirituality, maybe I could do a more internal one. How does that sound? Yeah? Because in order for us to connect externally, we need to connect internally. Would that be fair? Well, we'll just wait for a few moments and then I'll either nod or I'll go like that. Because what I'm going to actually do is talk about you. Everything about what I'm going to do in this moment is about how you connect to yourself. Someone taught you some things in life and it was consciously or subconscious teaching. And all of a sudden you made it part of you and you walk around and everything that you do is energy. Remember, you're an energy, yes? Or am I not? Right. All right. Your greatest mother is energy. And then you have matter. And now you just walk around with this matter. Uh, It's trillions, 100,000 trillion little pieces of matter. And uh, you're just a spiritual energy movement. How's that sound? That's a great way of putting a a meaning to what we are, I hope. Uh, But end of the day, when we look at ourselves, when we walk through the door, the first impact was energy. The second impact is smell, taste, touch, hear and see. Then the art, song, dance, language and story came after. So when you walked through the door, you felt the impact and you're not too sure where to go, where to sit. And you sort of, oh, got some good energy over here and good energy over there. And you started making your way around and getting to know people and and chatting. Would that be fair? And then someone smiled at you. You smelled a very nice perfume and maybe you might have not smelled a very nice perfume and you went, all right, I'm going to go this way. And then you went over and had some nice water and you tasted some of the things on the table. There's your first sort of movement of impact. Hey, my brother. Uh, And then we go to the next stage where the art, song, dance, language and story, all of a sudden you're starting to connect with people and you start talking about, hey, where are you from? Who's you, Marvin? And the story starts to happen. And then in some ways we start to do a little dance and we do a little bit of a song and away we go. So it's really important how we, when we walk through a room or go into any area, how we communicate with things around us internally and externally. If we're shut down internally, how is it that we're going to be able to connect in a healthy way externally? Very difficult, yes? And, and some of our parents gave us, and some of our great history gave us some really harsh lessons. And they said to you, we love you and you need to know this. We love you and you need to do this in life. We love you. It's a really tough world out there and you need to be strong, so I'm going to teach you this. Whatever that is, it's yours. You took it on and said, thank you very much. Yep, we don't mix with those Chinese people because we're this people and those people do those things and we do those things and that's what it is better if we just be this and then they be that. And those Africans and those Aboriginals and the English and Chinese, and the, they're all, we've all given them labels. And if you just stick to your culture and you'll be strong and you can face anything, would that be fair? Yeah, yeah, no, mm, yeah, good. See the chair's starting to get a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> so here we go. This is called the wisdom in your life. 
this uh, wonderful lady came into my life and I was trying to work out how to bring Aboriginal culture into my life in a really healthy way. I was going out onto culture and going with my uncle. He was saying, nephew, you want to learn about Aboriginal culture? Yes, but why are you here? Uh, to learn. But what's your motivation? Um, well, I was told I was different, uncle. I was told that we have this great culture. I was told that it was taken from us. I was told... And I was told, and I'm here to figure out what that is. What is this great myth that we're supposed to be? Because I never grew up with it. No one taught me this. But yet everyone then identified me as I got older that I was different. So might as well come out and find out what that is. Because <laughs> I don't know what it is. And that was fine. I was doing that for about maybe eight years nine years, going back and forth from the country. And as he started to give me some sort of a teaching, it wasn't really settling very well in my life because I was like going, well, what's the point? We are the tree. The tree is us. The river flows, so does our spirit. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it wasn't really impacting me in a holistic process. It was in the head, but it wasn't entering the heart. And if it doesn't enter the heart... It ain't going to the soul. And when you talk on a soul level, wow. When you talk on a heart level, coming from the soul, magic happens. When you start to go into the brain, that's where everything really makes sense. So this wonderful map was presented to me by Rosner Snyder while I was going through depression. I was looking at suicide as the way out because it was such a big turmoil trying to identify who I was and what it is that I was wanting in life and how I was wanting to help. Because all I really wanted to do was help people. But in the process of helping people, I found like I was actually depleting my life and I wasn't really filling my life. I was just giving. And there was no coming back. That's what it felt like to me. So all of a sudden, um, I said, woe is me. Life is hard and I'm just going to quit. And this wonderful lady came into my life while I was going through a process and she showed me this map. And it didn't, have, it didn't appear for a couple of years. It took me a while because subconsciously I knew that this woman gave me a sense of safety. Subconsciously I knew that this woman had something that really played a beautiful place inside my soul. But I didn't quite ask grasp through the thought. And as that started to rest my brain, my heart started to sort of come to a truth and then the soul answered, and then it appeared. So what happens is, is that up here, there's this little highway, relationship highway. What sort of high, uh, relationships do you have in your life? And please be free to just yell out what a relationship in your life is. Car? <laughs> Children? Family? Cook? Cooking? Animals? Parents, work, nature, sport, culture, the list goes on. But let me tell you, every relationship in your life will change. No relationship stays the same. Some get stronger, some get weaker. Can you remember the first time you met your husband or your wife? I gather it would be a little bit different from that moment then to what it is today. Would that be fair? Everyone's going, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking my language. <laughs> so every relationship changes. Some get stronger, some get weaker, some just disappear and some stay around consistently and you think, why? Right? So what we actually do is we can actually change the relationship ourselves. And this is what we call the voluntary off-ramp. What's a relationship that you can change in your life today? You choose to. You think about it and you go, yep, I want to change it. Obviously, you'd want to become a Collingwood supporter, but we're full, so we don't need any more. Okay? <laughs> Much appreciated for the thought. But uh, what's a relationship that you can change today? You. Did someone say me? You, yourself. Yes. Sorry? Work? How you see it? Come on, guys. 
If you want to take that wedding ring off your finger right now and walk out there doing so, I'm single because you can choose to do that, right? You can also choose not to have come today, but you chose to come today. So you have choices that you know that you can do, and, and there's plenty of relationships in your life that you can change on a regular basis, shoes, and so on. Up here, where we go off the catastrophe bridge, is where you don't have a choice. Anyone want to give me an idea when a relationship in your life changes when you don't have a choice? Death. First one comes off the rank. Divorce. Illness. Death. Dementia. Estrangement. Yes, someone leaves you. So there's things in our life that change very quickly around us that we have no choice about. But every time there's a choice of change or there's a, where we don't have a choice, we go into this place called the swamp of feelings. In there, it's a blame game. Anger and guilt. Anger blaming the people around you or others about the change or guilt blaming yourself. Yeah? And what happens is, if you come into this place of the swamp, what do you need to do when you're in water? You need to swim or tread water. You need to stay above water. And we uh, realise that if you want to do this and you fall into here, a really healthy way to swim the swamp is to acknowledge, feel and let go of whatever it is that's happening in, within your space, whatever relationship that might be. Acknowledge, embrace it and then let it go. So there was a stolen generation. We acknowledged it, finally, after so long. It's amazing how, how that can be hidden and not acknowledged crazily, but it is. And then we felt it when they said sorry. Kevin Rudd said, hey, sorry about that. But did we let it go? I don't think so. And people are walking around with this heaviness. And we have to go through a process of letting go. And that's on every level. Imagine the government that you thought and you felt was so strong and so good about giving unity and love for everything around us and giving everyone the freedom, the opportunities to do whatever you wish was founded on a, on a, on a, on a land that was purely given love and then all of a sudden there was a complete massacre of our people to get control. They wrote it in their books, in their journals. Don't bother bringing over all the army. We don't need them. They're just giving it away. They're putting their arms out and saying, handcuff me. Yay, what are we going to do about this? There was no real major fight. There was no war like they hit with the Indians or the any Maldi mob. Ah, come out there. And we know what happened then. They had a barbecue afterwards. And if you look at your history, you'll know that they were the only ones to actually defend, push off the English as they came up through warfare. And it was amazing that all of a sudden they got a treaty. The Indians got a treaty. The Aboriginal people didn't get a treaty because we just gave. And it's a harsh one to taste. It's a harsh one to embrace. But it's the truth. So nobody wants to talk about that history. Why would they? It's a terrible one. So we need to acknowledge, feel and let go. If we don't let go, we'll be stuck in there and constantly regurgitating this really terrible blame game. I choose love. I choose to move forward in a way that creates a beautiful future for me in any aspect that I choose, uh, wish to because my mother gave me life equally. If we don't swim, we go down to the levels of depression. In some ways I can show you that. Does it, oh, is it okay if I borrow your, va, your, va, um, your scarf? Yeah. Would you be able to come up to the front? Would that be okay? It's only a very yeah. talling thing. <laughs> See how I pulled her into it? See how... So, could I, yeah, could I, um, in your name? Sue. Sue. So this is like a veil, and I'm just going to place it over your head, okay? This is the first level of depression. Sue, can you see me? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> clearly? No? Not quite clearly, but there's a little bit of haze there. But you can see me, and we can talk to each other, but it's a little bit hazy. This is all in the mind. So for, for Sue, right now, she's just projecting what's inside her mind. But it's a little bit hazy. When I talk to her, I can sense there's a problem. So if I come to the side of you, see how the sides crinch in? So Sue may come a little bit tunnel vision, so she doesn't able to pick up the P's and the Q's. Sue, can you see me while I'm standing here? No. no? But if I come here, can you see me? 
just about. Just about. And if you see me, am I here? A little bit better. A little bit better. Until I get here, all of a sudden I seem a little bit more clearer. So for us, when we talk to Sue, we can diagnose her with a first level of depression or certain anxieties or maybe something like that. And what happens is Sue takes a cigarette and all of a sudden it comes up. It takes a little while to come down, but it does. What is Sue going to do? She's going to take another cigarette, isn't she? Yeah? So alcohol, having a wine or something like that, it just lifts it up and you feel like you can function and move. Thanks for that. Cheers, Sue. The next stage is when we put a bed sheet over your head. When we put a bed sheet over your head, all of a sudden you're seeing figures, you're seeing light, you're, you can't really talk, you're mumbling and everything's really becoming quite clear. You've got issues, right? And they're not having just one cigarette, they're having five or six or eight in within moments and that's coming down pretty quick. So most of us can diagnose very quickly that someone in this position has got some major issues going on. Not a problem. But when you have that cigarette, those cigarettes or that wine or whatever it might be bottle, it only goes to the to that one. The next one is when you put a, a, a black towel over your head and straight away isolation, suffocation, to try to talk to them, good luck. It's sleeping all day, hitting walls all day, and it's really quite tough to get them off the couch. We can diagnose them, not a problem. This is really quite easily. Have you ever seen someone at a party, someone you love and you care about, and they've just drank and drank about maybe 10 or, or four drinks of beer, and they say, give me the keys, I can drive. Because you're only going to go to the bed sheet. And they think they're functioning. And they're going, yeah, man, the more I drink, the better I get. I can tell you that right now. And you're saying, there's no way we're going to give you the keys. It's really, really bad. But they're not able to give you any clear idea about what to do forward. They just have this sense of that they can control drugs when they're on antidepressants. They actually, unfortunately, just do the same thing. They mask it. And all of a sudden, that pain or whatever it is, or that relationship that's ever changed in your life, unfortunately, is still there. So often you'll see that people on antidepressants, they'll take them, and then they'll go, I feel great. I don't need this anymore. I'm functioning and life's really good. Power to me. It's been like three years. So you go off them. And then it just, well, I thought I was doing all right. Because whatever it is that's happened in your life, that relationship change has not been moved in a healthy way. Acknowledge, felt, and let go. The, third, the, fifth, the fourth one is now when we put a, bed, uh, a uh, beach towel over your head. When we put the beach towel over your head, same thing as the black towel, internally isolated, suffocating, but externally happiness looks br so bright. They've got all the friends, they've got the job, and they've got all those wonderful things that we all wish for. These people get past the are you OK day. They don't even get asked because they're going through such a great life that looks so wonderful. All of a sudden they commit suicide and people go, oh, never known, never thought that it could ever... Why would that person do that? They have all this and then, they look at, then we look at our life and we fall into here. Well, that person had everything. Oh, I got this quarter of what that person had and they didn't want to live. What am I doing here? Then we have repetitive suicides. That was my cousin, my brother, my sister, my uncle, my auntie, my mum, my dad. People that were very close to you, but you weren't able to pick it up because they were able to give this sense of safety that they're doing things okay. Those people will use drugs, but it's multiple drugs. It's called a binge. And they do it maybe every three to four weeks or a month, or it's expanded. And when they do it, and they're jumping off the back of the, of the roof into the pool, and everyone goes, oh, that's crazy, man. Why would you do that? Why would you mix your drinks? And you went from wine to spirits to alcohol to speed to all those drugs of happiness that we put on the table. And then all of a sudden, you're doing backflips off buildings trying to, trying to be Superman. But at the end of the day, they'll just say, oh, well, you deserve it to let your hair down because you've worked so hard for everything you've got. 90% of your life is fantastic. So let's not be so critical on that person and they get past and get through the loop. Do you know anyone in any of these places at the moment as they go? Then there's a place where they don't want to feel. 
The change of relationship happens in any way, and they don't want to feel, and they go to this place here called the avoidance marsh. And when you avoid, you're thinking and doing. We think and do, we think and do, and we think and do, and we analyse and analyse and analyse and analyse, and let's just analyse everything. And then we'll change the world. If we just analyse it all, put it in like a little bit of a USB, and we'll send it to the happiness of happinesses of worlds of USBs, and we'll do it again in a few months, because then we'll do something, and we've just got to do, and we've just got to think, and we've just got to analyse, and just think, and analyse, and do, and analyse, and think, and do. We all came together, and we just got all the information. We're all really happy. Yes! We're going to change the world. And we put it all on a piece of paper and then we send it out in an email and say, anytime you've got depression or anytime you need any help in your life, there's the answer right there in front of you. Well, guess what? If you really want to be able to get someone to do anything, change anything in their life, I'm sure the information is pretty much right there, smack bang in their face. Are they making it a part of their life? Are they actually absorbing it in a way that's healthy? That's the difference. So for us... We have to change the way we actually give information to people. It has to be holistic. We can't just go through this belief that if we just give the information, life will be all easy and yay, yay, yay. Because if someone walked into your room today and said, I'm not feeling very well, that I'm sure it's very positive for, you to, for me to say that you're not going to turn and well, just be happy. Just have a smile on your face and everything will be okay, all right? I shouldn't smoke. Oh, really? That's fantastic. I'm glad you brought it up. All you have to do is stop, okay? Let's just go and put it in the bin and everyone will be happy. Yeah? All right? You're angry? Okay, just be happy. (laughs) This is really good. My job is so simple. Just giving out information like this. I thought it was tough. Thinkers and doers. Emotional people swamp with the feelings. People over here, they're in the desert where they disconnect completely from themselves and externally, and they just want to do. I tell you what, young boy, all you have to do is give me a shovel, I'll dig a hole and put a post in it, and then I'll walk in a direction that you point me in, and then I'll dig another hole and I'll put a post in it. I'll dig another hole and I'll put a post in it. I'll dig another hole and put a post in it. I don't want to hear no sub stories about life or anything like that. I don't want to have to think about it. All I need to know is the direction where the shovel is and how many posts I've got to put up and away we go. Well, that's not too bad to be there because everyone loves doers. If you really want to get someone to do something, man, and just get this person to do it because they'll be out there just doing. You don't have to think, they don't have to care, man, they're just like robots. And somewhere in our life, unfortunately, the scientists are finding a ways, believe it or not, this is so true, they're trying to take emotion away from you so that way you can just function in doing. Isn't that just, just is, really, is there any boundaries? There is none, really, is there? You know why there's no boundaries? Because we destroy the oceans. We destroy and pollute the air. We destroy and... Dis- the, it, there's so many living things that become extinct daily, it's just ridiculous. We're destroying so many externally, and that's why we're destroying ourselves internally. This is the truth, people. Nurture externally, you nurture yourself. Let's get back to loving our mother, our Buja. It'll come naturally that you've got to make sure that you look after yourself first and foremost. Some people get to the edge of this wonderful swamp or to the oceans, because this could be an ocean, let's be honest. And when you fall in there, because this could be really high, this could be the loss of someone you really love or a job that you loved or whatever it might be, and when you fall in here like a bungee cord straight down to the bottom, you wouldn't need a bungee cord to go straight to the bottom of your feeling. It's just completely disaster. And if you've got a really good coping mechanism where it brings you back up, and you feel it, acknowledge it, and you let go, and then you swim to the edges, and away you go. But some people swim to the edge, and they get stuck in the mud. When they get stuck in the mud, they're not sinking. And they go, oh, well, I'm not drowning. I feel pretty safe here. I must just stay here. And they're angry, and they're sad. Do you know many people that sit back and just start screaming all the answers to the world. You gotta do this, you gotta do that, and da da da. Okay? And other people at the back, it's just too hard. I wanna go fishing, I wanna go to the movies, I wanna go with the kids to the park, but I just can't do it. I just wanna stay here. And people come in to the person, Is it, would, would, Jason, would you be happy to stand up with me? We'll do it up here, mate. 
So here's Jason. Jason's stuck in the mud. So could you cross your legs for me, Jason? There we go. So Jason, you're stuck in the mud. You're angry, you're screaming, you're crying all day. It's just the way it is. And Jason, I see a lot in you, so I'm going to come across as a friend and go, Jason, you've got a lot to offer in life, mate, and this is not really good that you're sitting down and just doing nothing. How does it feel that I'm this close, Jason? Intimidating. Intimidating, because he can't move back because he's stuck. So what do you want to do? You actually try to lean backwards, or you give me, you want space, so you push me away. Push me. I go, man, I just came over. You don't see too many people knocking you down and coming to talk to you. I committed to you to sh say what you're actually good at, and you're just going to push me away? Oh, well, t to hell with you, Jason. See you later. And then you get back to uh, wherever, and um, they say, what happened? Oh, Jason's really tough. I went there, I spoke to him, I guided it all out, I was honest, I was committed to him, and then he just pushed me away, game over. Well, what we should do is offer Jason a place at this wonderful function that's coming up. We're a great organisation, so let's put on a great food, let's put on a really big fair, and we'll get all the elders and communities, we're talking about Aboriginal mob, whatever, and uh, we'll get him to come. So Jason, how you going, mate? Thanks. Uh, you, you know, uh, we're going to have a big fun fair over here, can you... Can you make your way over here? You just catch that bus and this one and you'll be here for sure. Someone, you know, will help you get here. So Jason can't move. He's very stuck. And if he does try to move, he's going to be very, very tired. And you get to the front door and he just walks out and goes, yeah, right, and back to the lounge. We call Jason. Jason, you missed your appointment. You missed your fun day. Where are you, mate? What's going on? Can't you see you need help? We're here. Please, wake up. So what happens is a really good worker comes along and says, you know what, I am the worker of all workers. I won't quit until I get this person out. So what he does, or she, comes along and reaches in, says, right, Jason, I'm going to pull you out, mate. This is what I do. This is my, my expertise. And I pull against Jason, and Jason pulls against me. We're both going to get tired. At some stage, we're just going to let go and go, too hard case basket. Go back to the office and go back to where everyone is and say, hey, you know what, Jason's too hard, let's just move around him. We need numbers. If we don't get numbers, we don't get refunded. So we've got to get all the kids to come and have the fair. Because when we're 30 kids come up, all of a sudden we've got the numbers and we all look really great and we get refunded. But Jason, unfortunately, gets missed. Jason, unfortunately, is the one person that everyone just moves around. That was me for about two and a half years, just sitting on the couch. It's amazing how people moved around me and didn't challenge me after a few weeks or a few months. Every now and then someone will come in and say, Sean, how can you change that much? You put on so much weight. I love food. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happens is if, uh, if Jason's stuck, the best way for us to come in is on the side. Jason, how does it feel that I'm here to your side? Okay. And in some ways I can actually put my hand on your shoulder and give you a sense of safety and in balance. Would that be fair? Yeah. Is that okay? If yeah. My, yeah? Okay. So, Jason, now, if we want to connect to a person, we've actually now gone into space with him and we've actually connected physically. If that's our main goal, then, geez, how far have we come? And what happens is Jason sees everything very comfortably. He's not feeling as though that I'm coming in harshly. And I can see everything. And then I tell him my story and he tells me his story. And all of a sudden, I put my feet in the un under your feet and show him that, you know what? I was committing suicide too. I found life hard. And maybe in some way we can actually support each other and grow as one and walk together side by side instead of us coming in, pushing and shoving and expecting the answers to be so clear. Thank you very much, Jason. So that's the first. Thank you very much, Jason. Excellent. So here's the kicker. Now we've got to get into this place called the Forest of Hope. You hope you're out of it, but you're not quite there yet. And you get knee deep in the shit. We all know there's a lot of shit in our life, right? And when you get knee deep in it, it's time out where you reflect and you bury yourself into it. And what happens is we're asking you to be a seed. This is the moment where you actually expose yourself to all the manure around you and you start to absorb everything that we thought was really, really terrible, but you could grow something beautiful from it and shine and become that beautiful garden that everyone wants to be a part of and walk into and go, wow, 
Jeez, I'm just so lucky to be here, to be a part of this, whatever that is. I've told that in prisons. I've told it in places where people have done some really bad things. And I can tell you, this murderer stood up and looked at me and he says, Sean, I went, I hope this is good. (laughs) He said, Sean, you're telling me that what I did, I can use as manure and create something beautiful from. Is that what you're trying to tell me? And I said, well, yes. You're off your head, Sean. You do know I murder people. I said, yeah, I know. He told us. Imagine what you can do while you're in here because you're coming out of here in a body bag. Imagine what you could do to change those guys' lives that are out that door or any one of these guys in here that are close to following your footsteps. Imagine if I, we are able to empower you to utilise that in a way that actually grows something beautiful. People will not give up on love and hope. He cried his eyes out. He said, please teach me, Sean. Can you teach me this? And then another person who's going out of body bag says, I want to do it as well. And then another one and another one. A maximum security prison. They had hope. And I guarantee you, Without shadow of a doubt, I'm hoping that it just gave you hope. That no matter where you are in your life, you have an opportunity. You just have to become a seed where you break down your outer shells that you believe are so tough. Your environment needs to be right. And that's where the key is. That sh- that sh- the, the, sh- the seed will not allow itself to become exposed until the temperature, the water, the nutrients, everything around it is there and available. As soon as it opens up, the internal part that's very soft love, then all of a sudden absorbs everything around it and all of a sudden it's got a chance at life. And from there, it'll never ever be the same again. You will never be the same again. You will grow and learn and love. It's going to get rocky when you go up into this rocky path because you need the people around you. Imagine the people that are around you now that need your support. Instead of you going to their door knocking and saying, you need help, you need to do this, you need to do that, da-da-da-da. Imagine if they were able to go through this process and actually have internal love for themselves and turn around and go, hello, your name? Vanessa, uh, I know we've got an appointment tomorrow, but I need you today. Is it possible for me to come and see you now? Because, you know, and we keep that appointment tomorrow because I really got a motivating process that I need to get you on because I can see the future is looking so damn great. I just need to be around you to get to where I need to go to. And that's up here in the Seymour Mountains. And when you're up there and you've had people support you, lift you up or pull you up or even side by side, whatever it is, encouraging you in a healthy way, You see these relationships you never, ever thought you could ever have. Because you're up so high, you can see all the things that are going to get in the way and the obstacles that are going to be a bit tough. But does that stop you? No. Because you put a plan together, inside and externally. And once you commit to your plan, these guys who committed murder all of a sudden realise that they could have relationships with themselves and externally in a healthy way. Maybe not able to change the the sadness that they gave others, but there's an opportunity there for you to utilise it in a way to help nurture others and grow from. Then you come back around here and you wait for it to change because every relationship in your life will change. you just got to be prepared for it. I'm going to be in these places every day. I'm going to avoid something. I'm going to feel things. I'm going to disconnect from some things. But I'm not going to get stuck there. And if I do get stuck there, I've got people around me who will notice it, who are part of my team, and will give me the support to be able to move forward. Acknowledge, feel and let go. Acknowledge, feel and let go. So who here can identify themselves in a place in any of these Anyone else willing to put their hand up? Sometimes we need to support the supporters. Sometimes we need a place where we can be honest and open and transparent. 
when we do this workshop, we take people through every part of the map. We get you to feel it, acknowledge it, and see how it is within your life. And then you have an honest conversation with yourself. And we also support that energy around you. Once you're able to give yourself a sense of truth and take ownership of yourself, then the rest that we do with you will be about unifying, not about us dragging you along or forcing anything upon you. Because when you go through this, you go to the next one, which is the uh, compass, and it's about understanding your true core. Every person is born with your own personal core, and we've got ways to be able to acknowledge that. And as you go into that space, that's when you really start to look at everyone around you in a different light, I can tell you. You don't always just see them as being in these, these three places. You look at them as a complete and utter being of love. So any questions? We've only got a couple of minutes left. Anybody? Someone got a burning desire to say something as I got, went through that process? Please, I hope you feel comfortable enough to, to speak it. Might be an opportunity to give someone else a voice. No? Great. If I've created a very big impact in your moment, then I've made a difference. If I'd gone up here and given you information, you walked out the door feeling, hey, yes, yeah, Sean made us feel really, really good, then you, that energy would only last for so long. But when I shift your chair and I go deep down into that soul place and get past your, your thoughts and, and your, your heart and talk a bit of truth, all of a sudden greatness can be done. Don't feel alone. Get in contact with us, wisdom in your life, or anyone around you who you feel as though you can go and talk to after this process. It's a great thing to do now is to nurture yourself if you have an internal movement because we're all moving internally if we open up the door to our truth. And if anyone got a bath here? Everyone got a bath? Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay, if you've got a bath tonight, go home, put 10 minutes, maybe two songs or three, slap it on the door, time out, and whoever knocks on the door tries to kick it in, do not answer, turn the music up a little bit louder, but have a nice warm bath. Because subconsciously as you go through this process, or, or even though you may think you weren't going through it, something is jumping out at you internally. And we hope that you nurture that and just allow it to settle. And going and have a nice warm bath where you just have that moment to be able to go back to your mother's womb. You remember when you are in your mother's womb? Yep. No, you shouldn't do. <laughs> it would be pretty crazy. But inside, you're laying in there, you feeling the, feel the water on the side of your, your legs or your shoulders, wherever that may be. And if you've got a really big bath and you're pretty lucky, it's right there and linked to your chin. Uh, then just put on some candles, smell it. And put a little bit of soft music in the background, a bit of Enya. Sail away, sail away. <laughs> Just allow yourself to be present for a little bit. Nurture yourself for 20 minutes or 10 minutes if you can. Allow yourself to just say you're safe, you're nurtured, you're loved, you're cared about. And um, allow the music and the candle do its job in the beautiful water. Thank you very much for having me.